And now, please welcome to the podium, Reverend John, who is the embodiment of spirit divine. He is an emissary of love and joy and peace and light, and we have affectionately called him John the Beloved, because he is. Please help me welcome oh, Reverend John. <laughs> Good morning for the third time. And a special welcome to you all and to those who join us in consciousness, wherever they are, and those who join us on the World Wide Web. Last week, Reverend Michael Record and I concluded the third cohort of classes at the Tower Street Adult Correctional Center here in Kingston. The classes which are titled Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life are supposed to span 12 weeks and then on week 13 participants share their learnings and are presented with a certificate. It's rather a nice certificate actually of participation. Now you would think, wouldn't you, that since we have a captive audience, so to speak, uh, that there would be no problem whatsoever getting our participants to attend class. But friends, there are challenges, mostly administrative, in getting the students to class. <laughs> for this most recent cohort, just give you an example. Some of the students were also listed for another class, which was scheduled for the same time in another part of the facility. At other times, officers may forget or neglect to sign the release form, which permits residents to leave their block to attend class. We're happy to say, too, that in several instances, we have also lost participants because they were either transferred to a more comfortable facility, or they received payroll and joyfully left to rejoin their families. One such, when he heard the good news that he was going home, expressed his regrets at missing the last few classes. I said, well, stay now. He said, you're mad. <laughs> so he gave me his home address and with a look of doubt on his face said, y you can get my certificate to me and I promised, so I will honor that promise this week. So the third cohort by graduation day, I mean, it's, it's a very simple graduation. There are the certificates, there's Reverend Michael and I and there is the correctional officer who escorts us um, to and from and stays with us during classes. But we make it as grand as we can. And the number at that last uh, graduation was four. Four people actually had to graduate. But of that four, one had to be, um, wasn't released from, from his block, so, and, and one had already left, so we had two with us. But let me share with you some of the written comments that these two made. And they, they re actually reflect the comments that all of our participants have made for all three courses. Quote, I have learned about showing love and kindness to my fellow humans. Another, I will always remember to forgive and give positive words of encouragement all the time. Another wrote, this course has left me feeling empowered and thinking in a spiritual and positive way. Another one writes, this course allows you to examine your life, to see where you have gone wrong, and it allows you to make positive lifestyle changes. Still another, it makes you strive to be an excellent role model for your peers while building your character on Christ-like principles. And the, one of those that I like very much is something I'm going to do differently from now on. I'm going to ensure that I'm in tune with the spirit of God which flows through all living things. And finally, the last one I want to share with you is, I recommend that every inmate should enroll in this program. In line with that last recommendation, that everyone should have a chance to attend this course, Reverend Michael and I have suggested to the authorities that we have two classes every Tuesday, rather than the two of us conducting one class, um, that we'd have two classes, and the chapel that we use is big enough so that we can have a class at either end without disturbing each other. Because, you know, where Michael, Michael's classes are kind of noisy. <laughs> We're also proposing to do a class in leadership for the correctional officers. 
So please, because they need, you know, they're as much in prison as the prisoners, okay? So please keep us in your prayers for right action and divine order and for uh, officials who sign the papers to allow our class members to get out of their section and into our class in the chapel. But you know, friends, this morning we just acknowledged the achievement of several members of our spiritual family who received accreditation from Centers for Spiritual Living for having successfully completed our classes. And we shared the joy of their achievement and might even have been inspired to begin taking classes ourselves. Hint, hint, hint. But at Tower Street, as I told you, apart from the correctional officer who escorts us to class every week, and he's a wonderful soul called Mr. Dixon, who really is just so loving and compassionate. He really tries his best. But apart from him, there are no witnesses to this small but significant miracle of achievement in the lives of men who find themselves in what must be the most demotivating and dehumanizing and demoralizing circumstances imaginable. And yet, friends, many of these men have told Reverend Michael and I that it is in prison that they have found their life's purpose. And it is our program that has helped them to find joy and hope and meaning in their lives. And so since there is no absence in the one presence, as you all know, God is everywhere equally evenly present, and there is no time in the one presence, since the living Spirit Almighty knows no time or space, I'm going to ask you at this moment to join me in giving our graduates from all three classes a standing ovation. Would you stand and give them a applause? Then? My heart full. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My encouragement today is titled, God Knows Only Perfection. And it is dedicated to these wonderful sons of God who, just like many of us, are trying to understand their relationship to the Almighty and their place in the universe. You know, one Tuesday towards the end of this last cohort, one of our students, who by the way is a university graduate, engaged Reverend Michael and I in a discussion as to whether God created evil. He's, he considers, his considered opinion is that since God is everything and knows everything and God created everything, God must have created both good and evil. God must have created both health and sickness. So Reverend Michael and I argued with, with, hit with them, and we, were, we weren't in the chapel as usual, because there were just two of us, two of them and two of us. So we stayed in the computer lab, which was full of guys learning, learning computers. So they stopped what they were doing to listen to our little mini class and why they surrounded us. And there was a hush in the room, you know. And he said, no, God created evil. God created Satan. So we are trying to say, God is good, and only goodness can come from good. You know, and he said, but I don't understand it because, because God, God must have created the evil too. So anyway, we had this wonderful discussion. And in fact, I think many of the people who were listening, who were on the computer course, are going to be signing up to come to class because they were saying, rotted, but they sound good, man. But you see, friends, his profound question, and you may have pondered it yourself, pinpointed for me what I see as a strange paradox in many people's approach to healing. Healing of mind, healing of body, and healing of our affairs and circumstances. Many devout folks still believe that if they are suffering from illness or other misfortune, that it is God's will because God created it. But God knows only perfection. In Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, we read, and I quote, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity." Unquote. If illness and misfortune was God's will for humankind, no one, not even the beautiful Jesus, who the Bible relates healed all manner of diseases, Matthew 4, 23, not even Jesus could effect a healing, for no one can contravene the will of God. 
In spite of this, many people still hold the belief that the ability to call forth the perfection of God was the exclusive purview of the man from Galilee. He alone could heal, they think, because he alone was divine. This mistaken belief gave rise in the early church to the rationalization that sickness and suffering is really God's will and that the sufferer would be rewarded in some future far off heaven for stoically submitting to illness and to misfortune. The practice of medicine was so severely frowned upon by the early church that Emperor Justinian closed the medical schools of Athens and Alexandria in AD 529. This disapproval was perpetuated throughout the centuries, and in AD 1215, Pope Innocent III condemned surgery. I agree with him. But in 1248, the dissection of the body was also pronounced sacrilegious, and the study of anatomy totally condemned. Can you imagine that? No surgery, no study of anatomy, nothing, because that was all God's purview. Thank goodness that human curiosity and the thirst for knowledge prevailed, or we would still be living in the, those dark ages. We've come a long way from that early mistrust of scientific inquiry to the understanding that our bodies are superbly natural, self-correcting organisms with the potential to live indefinitely. Dr. Herbert Barley, in his book, Quiet Healing Zone, co uh, writes, and I quote, freely functioning, our divine, physical, mental, spiritual vehicle is created to be useful indefinitely. In its unique creative plan, its rejuvenation of each cell, its automatic production of replacement parts before they are needed, and the dusting off of the predecessor in its, is its natural way of immortality. Nothing can impede this normal process. So long as the pure creative thought envelops the mechanism, it operates flawlessly. It faces all adversarial conditions and masterfully remains untouched and its integral self. End of that quote by Dr. Bailey. So when the beautiful Jesus went about in Galilee healing all manner of disease, what he was really demonstrating is the superbly natural wholeness of life. His healing practice was deemed miraculous, implying that there were events in the physical world which deviated from the laws of nature. But the truth is, we live in an orderly universe in which the deviation from law is quite impossible. It, if a healing is accomplished, whether by Jesus or by a science of mind practitioner or a spiritual healer or a modern medical practitioner, it is, it is a demonstration of the natural wholeness and perfection of life. This is what Ernest Holmes, founder of the Science of Mind, meant when he said that in the practice of spiritual mind treatment or scientific prayer, we must start with the simple premise, the nature of God, of man, and of being is perfect. Say with me, perfect God, perfect man, perfect being together. Perfect God, perfect man, and perfect being. And that man, of course, includes woman, so it means mankind. Exceptional as healing may appear, we should realize that although it might have dealt with the healing law on a higher level than we now understand, no laws have been transgressed. It is natural, or if you prefer, superbly natural, divinely natural, and it is our divine right. Jesus himself said that he came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, Matthew 5, 17. He consistently refused to set aside natural law, which is why when he was tempted by his own human consciousness to turn stones into bread in the wilderness, he refused by saying, and I quote, thou shalt not tempt the Lord, and you can read that as thou shalt not tempt the law, thy God. Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11. Jesus knew that his power and ours was not in changing the immutable laws of the universe, but in his insightful understanding of the laws of life. Eric Butterworth, one of my favorite New Thought writers, puts it this way, quote, 
Jesus was not a magician. In his ministry, he simply fulfilled the divine law on a higher level than anyone else has before or since. The miracle healings were not only an evidence of the divinity of Jesus, they also evidenced the divinity of man, of the very person healed. The potential for healing is in every person simply because he is innately divine, innately whole and complete. Jesus' insight was so great and he saw the divinity in the other person with such intensity that there was a healing light. His faith quickened the sleeping potential and it sprang forth into full and perfect life." Unquote. So in that little discussion at the Adult Correctional Facility, Robert Mack and I were saying to our inquiring student, if you have a son and he is created in your image and likeness and he goes off and does something which is a discredit to you as his father or to his family if he makes a mistake, if he wanders away from home and squanders his fortune like the prodigal son, is he not still your son? And nothing you can do or say can separate him from the fact that he carries your DNA, he is your pekini. So therefore, the same thing applies to all of God's creation. God's perfection is innate in all life kind. So friends, Jesus taught and practiced spiritual healing widely and said it is not the will of the Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish, Matthew 18, 14. He clearly believed in the right of people to be healthy and he healed all manner of illnesses as we are told. He insisted that we should look past the appearance of ill health and dis-ease in the three-dimensional world of time and space and form, telling us in John 7, 24, quote, judge not according to appearances, but judge righteous judgment, unquote. He taught that man lives in two worlds, not in succession, but concurrently. On this plane, we have fluctuating experiences of sickness and health. We may have experienced peace and disharmony. Um, there may be discord. But we also simultaneously live in a spiritual world as spiritual beings. And that is where the perfection lies for all eternity. He was therefore saying, don't judge by what you see in the mirror. You are, you are whole even if you are experiencing the outward appearances of sickness. And furthermore, you can be healed because you are whole on the spiritual side. Paul echoes this truth in 1 Corinthians 13 um, when he says, we see in a glass darkly. And then he says that we must come to see how? Face to face. Because beyond the appearance reflected in the mirror of your life is the total, whole, and perfect spiritual person, spiritual being that you are. And that is the real truth of who you are. That is what is revealed when you experience a healing. Butterworth puts it this way, quote, there is that of you that is greater than your weakness. Just, just, just remember that, there is that of you that is greater than your weakness, stronger than your fears. The fourth dimensional creature that is whole even within your sickness. This is that of you that is the perfect idea in the mind of God. You are simply asleep to this greater self, your innate divinity. And Paul says, awake thou that sleepest, that Christ might shine upon thee. Ephesians 5 verse 14. And what is Christ, my friends, but your own divinity? The particularization of the infinite source of life into the pattern of infinite embodiment that is you. It is a perfect pattern, it is whole, and it is you at the point of God. You are perfect because you are created by perfection. Let us affirm together, God in me knows only perfection. Together, God in me knows only perfection. God as me can only be whole. God as me can only be whole. And so your assignment this week, thought you got away? Your assignment this week is to practice calling forth 
the perfection of God in your mind, body, and affairs. If you feel agitated or worried, say, God in me knows only perfect peace. Can I get that? God in me knows only perfect peace. If you feel like chicken gunya or any other chick is getting the best of you, say, God in me knows only perfect health together. God in me knows only perfect health. If you have a strained relationship with someone, say, God in me knows only perfect harmony in my relationships. Can we say that? God in me knows only perfect harmony in my relationships. If you have a financial challenge, affirm, God in me knows only perfect prosperity. Want to say that? God in me knows only perfect prosperity. And then come to class this Tuesday or on Thursday. And <laughs> if you can make two both. Yes, thank you, Reverend Michael. And even though you may have missed the first class or two, you're quite welcome to start this week. Just call the office so we can prepare the, the, amount, the right amount of handouts for you. Friends, begin now today to accept your innate perfection. Be willing right here and now to let go of anything less than wholeness in your mind, body, and the body of your affairs. Praise and bless God's perfection in everything and in everyone. And so let's begin right now by turning to your neighbor and saying, I behold you with eyes of love and I glory in your perfection. Namaste. I behold you with eyes of love and I glory in your perfection. I behold you with eyes of love and I glory in your perfection. I behold each of you with eyes of such deep love, and I glory in your God-given perfection. Namaste.